Okay, we're all set. This is a great example of how mushrooms can be involved in healing the soil. Um, but mushrooms are also, for millions of years, have been used for healing human beings. Can you give an example of medicinal mushroom use that um, would be particularly informative? The, uh, the mushroom species that immediately comes to mind for medicinal use, both historically and in modern times, is agaricon, Fomitopsis officinalis which Dioscorides first described in 65 AD as a treatment against consumption and other respiratory illnesses, later thought to be known tuberculosis. So 2,000 years ago, in the first Materia Medica, the very first pharmacopoeia, officinalis is the official medicine of choice. That's why it's called officinalis. And for 2,000 years, this mushroom was used. It's also called the quinine fungus. It doesn't have quinine, but it has a chalk-like uh, appearance. It grows the size of a beehive. And it's the oldest growing mushroom in the environment that I know of. It grows for up to 100 years under really inclement weather conditions. In the Alps of Austria, uh, now thought to be extinct largely in Europe, in Washington State, Oregon, Northern California, and in British Columbia, Canada. And we have gone into the old growth forest collecting this mushroom. We now have a library of 37 strains, the largest library by a factor of 10, I think, of anyone in the world. And we're trying to save the species from extinction. We were working with the BioShield program, the U.S. Defense Department, directly after 9-11. I sent hundreds of samples to the U.S. government's BioShield biodefense bio program because the U.S. government and other governments recognized that bioterrorism by far was the biggest uncontrolled threat. Viruses don't care about borders. If you had 10 al-Qaeda infected with smallpox coming through different borders and making contact you know, at food stands and restrooms, through contact with crowded people, we could have a, pan, a pandemic of smallpox. After 1968, no one's, no one's been immunized. So smallpox was the number one virus of concern with the U.S. Defense Department. We sent hundreds of, of extracts because my cultural library was recognized as being unique. And lo and behold, the results came back and the anti-smallpox properties were localized in agaricon. Now, what a lot of people may not understand um, is when you get viral infections, oftentimes bacterial infections ensue. And so the virus harms your immune system. It can, you know, with flu viruses, can scar your lungs, and then bacterial infections ensue. Well, agaricum was used to fight largely bacterial infections, and, and according to the historical record, we know very little about its actual use. I'm sure at the Library of, of Alexandria, there have been whole tomes on agaricon and its use probably. Um, but the fact that agaricon has dual antiviral and antibacterial properties and has a 2,000 year history of use is a real strong testimonial of a mushroom growing in endangered habitats like the old growth forest that if we, we protect and we invest in the protection of that species and understand it better, we could save literally millions of lives. And in the past four weeks, my collaborators at the National Center for Natural Products Research at the University of Minnesota, uh, Mississippi uh, uh, Dr. Susan Manley, Dr. Samir Ross, uh, and Shabana uh, Ka, uh, Ka um, finally, after f more than five years of bioguided fractionation, we have identified a cluster of novel antiviral compounds, heretofore undiscovered, that are active against viruses. When we sent these extracts of agaricon to test against flu viruses, we also had an exceptionally high activity. Now, exceptional high activity of a natural extract against positive controls, which are pure pharmaceuticals, at the same concentrations. So our natural extracts obviously have something in them that's very, very powerful. So here is, you know, those are, that's a real clear example how one mushroom in the old growth forest, what people may not understand is that we share in common many of the same pathogens that afflict mushrooms. So Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, E. coli, they also attack mushroom mycelium. Mm -hmm. And so the host defensive resistance of the mycelium against those pathogens, we can also benefit from. The fact that this fungus is duly active against an RNA virus, like flu viruses, and a DNA virus, like smallpox, is a conundrum. And it may be that there's not a category of medicine yet to describe something that's duly active against both sets of viruses, because typically that's thought to be a toxin, not a medicine. But the fact that we know it is less toxic than sidofavir and ribavirin, but far more potent than those two pharmaceuticals, you know, is a testimonial that we've found something quite interesting and new. So we've been approved for small mammal studies, and I think one thing we can be assured of, and it's a prediction I will make that will be unfortunately be true, 
is that as ecosystems are impaired, we will have pandemic storms. We're going to have them increasingly happening. We have this massive flood in Pakistan. We have a new bacteria that has a transponder gene coming out of New Delhi from cosmetic surgery. If that transponder gene gives, makes all bacteria resistant to all known antibiotics, this is not a good thing. And so we are on the edge of a pandemic storms that will hit us from different directions unless we can increase our host defensive resistance by investing in biodiversity, by investing in fungi that create the soils that give biodiversity. Unless we do all, all of that, uh, you know, our time on this planet may be quite limited. So if, 